people over at Ford Service Engineering recently asked a number of technicians to tell them which topics they'd like to know more about. Topics with practical, everyday value, right here in the shop. Frankly, you confirmed what they already suspected when you said you want more information on diagnosing and servicing engine noise and leakage concerns. So here it is, in the form of this video and the booklets and job aids that go along with it. In the first part of the video, we'll share what we've learned about engine noise concerns from technicians like you and from Ford's own NVH, noise, vibration, and harshness experts. In the second part of the program, we'll share the latest information on engine sealing and leak diagnosis. For each topic, we'll provide important background information. We'll describe and demonstrate diagnostic procedures that work. And we'll share a number of tips that will help you make the needed repair the right way. Let's get started. Noise and vibration are present in all motor vehicles to some degree. And that's not necessarily bad. The sound of the engine lets the driver know it's running, preventing ring gear and starter damage. The noise from a component that's worn or needs adjusting provides an early warning sign that service is needed, ASAP. When you're called on to solve a noise or vibration concern, it'll either be pretty straightforward, like this belt squeal, or it'll put everything you know about noise diagnosis to the test. One reason noise diagnosis can be so challenging is that people react to noise in different ways. A sound a customer finds unpleasant or unusual may sound fine to you. In fact, it may prove to be normal. Then again, the customer's hearing may be more sensitive than most. Or he's so focused on the sound that he just can't get it out of his mind. To be a successful NVH diagnostician, you have to develop a basic set of skills. Then put those skills to work in a logical diagnostic method. You should also approach every noise concern as though the vehicle's trying to tell you something. To understand what the vehicle's saying, you must learn to tell the difference between noise that originates in the engine and noise that's coming from someplace else in the vehicle. To do that, you need to understand how the vehicle and engine are built and are designed to operate together. When you isolate a noise, you must be able to determine if it's a sign of a potentially harmful condition or if it's a normal engine sound. To your customer, any unusual noise may be a cause for alarm. This videotape and the materials that accompany it can help you develop the skills you need and the methods you should practice. But before we talk about diagnosis, let's take a closer look at the subject of automotive noise and what causes it. The term NVH describes any tactile or audible disturbance that detracts from customer appreciation. In other words, the way the vehicle feels or sounds is unacceptable to the customer. One reason NVH concerns occur is because a vehicle's components, its frame, suspension, and steering, its powertrain, and its body tend to resonate with and amplify a vibration that might by itself be barely obvious. Higher frequency sounds, like the ticking of solenoids or valve train hash and tick, may find their way into the passenger compartment through openings in body sealing materials, or may be transmitted along the accelerator and shift cables to the passenger compartment. Although we can't hear most vibrations, some, especially the low frequency ones, are transmitted into the passenger compartment where they're felt as vibration or shaking in the steering wheel or floor pan, for example. Structure-borne vibrations like these may be caused by such things as unbalanced engine accessories, worn engine and powertrain mounts, grounded exhaust system components, or tires and wheels with excessive runout. Vibrations that are transmitted through the air produce audible sounds which we may judge to be pleasant or unpleasant. Typical sources of powertrain airborne noise include the engine, fan, engine accessories, the air induction system, the transmission, and the exhaust as it exits the tailpipe. When does normal vehicle sound start to become objectionable? As a rule, 
when a part fails due to fatigue, wear, or weakness, or when the vehicle suffered from inadequate maintenance or harsh treatment. New vehicles may exhibit special concerns due to changes in manufacturing or assembly routines. For concerns like these, see a current TSB on the subject. Diagnosis starts the minute a customer drives in and ends when the exact cause of the noise concern is isolated. A complete diagnosis includes a diagnostic interview, a road test, a visual inspection of the vehicle, including the engine and other powertrain components, careful listening to isolate the location of the noise, and confirmation that the diagnosis is correct by gauging the components you believe to be faulty using your eyes, ears, and measuring instruments. These diagnostic activities must be performed so you can answer three critical questions. One, when does the noise occur? Two, is the noise associated with any other irregularities? And three, where does the noise come from? To answer the first question, when does the noise occur? You must identify the operating conditions which are most closely associated with the noise. These include engine temperature and load, and engine speed. To answer the second question, is the noise associated with any other irregularities? Pay attention to the customer's description and determine if a performance or drivability concern that might be related to the noise is also present. To answer the third question, where does the noise come from? You'll have to listen carefully to the way the vehicle and engine sound in the shop and on the road. As you come up with the answers to these questions, pieces of the noise puzzle will fall into place. The diagnostic interview gives the customer a chance to tell his story and enables you to pick up details that will help you pinpoint the cause. The customer should be questioned to learn when the noise occurs, when the engine's cold or hot, at which vehicle and engine speed and load, and if the noise is more noticeable on acceleration, deceleration, or when the vehicle's in a coast or float mode. It's also important to ask how long the concerns existed. A recent repair or accident could be related to it. Also included in the vehicle's history are any performance problems the customer may have noted. Take spark knock, for example. In addition to the knock or ping, he may have noticed the engine running hot, a loss of power, or poor fuel economy. These are all valuable clues that help you get to the root cause of the concern. Of course, we also depend on the customer to tell us what the noise sounds like. With the interview done and a repair order in hand, perform a road test. We recommend a road test for every noise concern, even if you're pretty sure the answer you're looking for is in the engine. This is because a road test gives you the opportunity to confirm that a noise is present and also enables you to identify the conditions under which the noise occurs. Take the customer with you and let him drive too. That way he can help you pinpoint the noise and you can gauge the effect of his driving habits on the concern. Letting the customer drive gives you freedom to concentrate more on the noise and less on the traffic. During the road test, keep track of any irregularities you detect and when they occur. Write down your findings on a copy of the road test form that's provided in the booklet that accompanies this video. The road test form will help you organize your approach so important clues will be identified and nothing left to chance. The form provides space for you to record historical information about the concern, when and how it began, for example. It also permits you to record the vehicle speed, engine speed, and gear the vehicles in when the noise appears, the driving conditions that affect the concern, where a vibration's felt, if at all, and if a noise is present, what it sounds like and its frequency. Don't feel you have to limit yourself to the options on the form. Write in your own description of the sound of the noise 
and any other information you believe will help your diagnostic efforts. When you hear the noise, remember that some noises are more commonly associated with the steering, suspension, exhaust, and body trim, while others more likely come from the engine or even the motor mounts. Another factor you should pay attention to is the road surface you're on and the noises it produces. If the noise only appears when you hit a bump or the customer says that's it when you go from asphalt to concrete pavement, you've picked up some valuable clues that just made your job a lot easier. Back at the shop, block the wheels, set the parking brake firmly, and perform a neutral engine run-up test. This test is especially important if you notice noise or vibration in a particular RPM range during the test drive. If you can duplicate the condition with the vehicle standing still in park or neutral, the root cause is very likely in the engine. Because run-up tests are performed with the vehicle stationary, they eliminate road and wind noise and powertrain noises that are associated with the drive shaft or half shafts, axles and tires. If the vehicle is equipped with an automatic transmission, you may also wish to perform a drive engine run-up test. A drive engine run-up test may be more effective than the neutral engine run-up test because it places greater strain on the powertrain and may enable you to duplicate a vibration or noise that's related to load. Always be sure the wheels are blocked, the parking brake is set, and the service brakes are depressed firmly before engaging the transmission. And use a tachometer to make sure you do not exceed 1600 RPM. To protect the catalytic converter, never hold this engine speed for more than five seconds. A visual inspection of the vehicle and the engine are next. Check the vehicle for any conditions which might produce the noise or vibration you noticed. Many of the procedures that should be performed are described in the NVH section of the Vehicle Service Manual. The topics covered there include the diagnosis of high-speed shake, tip-in moan, idle boom, shake and vibration, and engine accessory vibration. These procedures will take you step by step to the most likely cause of the condition you noticed. Be sure to familiarize yourself with what the manual has to offer. If the checks you've made indicate that the condition's under the hood, visually check for anything out of the ordinary before assuming the engine's at fault. Check for loose cables or harnesses that may be tapping against sheet metal. Determine if a bracket's worked loose. See if a pulley shows excessive runout. If you locate an obvious source of the noise, make the necessary repair and repeat the road test to confirm that the concern has been eliminated. If you fail to detect anything visibly wrong, isolate the noise by careful listening. Because you're more likely to hear some engine noises at different locations, work around the engine and listen from above, from the front, and from below if necessary. When you find the general location of the noise, search for a more precise location. To amplify the noise and reduce distracting background sound, use an automotive stethoscope or the more high-tech engine ear. Either can help you pinpoint a noise reasonably well. When using a stethoscope, hold the probe at 90 degrees to the surface or as close to 90 degrees as possible. If the rod is tilted so that its tip fails to make good contact, you may pick up background noise, or you may hear the sound of the tip skidding across or bouncing on the surface you're probing. Plant the tip firmly to obtain a clear sound. Then move the probe from place to place to locate the spot where the noise is loudest. As you're probing around the engine, stay away from moving parts like the belts, pulleys, and fan. And for your own safety, never probe moving parts. Before we move ahead and consider some of the specific engine noises you may experience, let's take a minute to review what the diagnosis has achieved and what you've learned thus far. First, you've confirmed that the customer's concern is valid. Second, you've focused your search on the most likely causes of the noise. The road test, 
engine run-up tests, visual inspection, and careful listening enabled you to do this by eliminating trial and error and guesswork. That's what a thorough diagnosis is all about, a logical and systematic process of elimination. Third, you've seen that it's important to use the right tools in your diagnosis, like a stethoscope or engine ear. While you'll usually be able to find the general location of a noise with your ears alone, tools like these help you pinpoint a more precise location. With the noise pinned down to the engine, the last step in the diagnosis is to confirm that you've come to the right conclusion. If you believe the concern originates in the valve train, inspect and, if necessary, measure the components that may be at fault. You'll soon learn that most valve train noises sound pretty much the same, so it'd be easy to overlook the one that's really the source. For extra assistance, instructions for performing static and dynamic valve train analysis are provided in the vehicle's service manual. As you confirm your diagnosis and get ready to make the repair, also remember that it's not enough to eliminate the noise. The noise is only a symptom. You must make sure that you eliminate the irregularity that causes the noise. Otherwise, it'll probably come back to haunt you. In the belt squeal example we showed at the start of the program, we didn't just inspect the belt. We checked the pulleys, too. We made sure they were aligned correctly and turned freely. We'll talk more about belts in a few minutes. Whenever you're conducting inspections and making repairs, be sure to check your service manual and TSBs for the latest specs on the parts you're checking, as well as the correct procedures to follow. Internal engine components are likely to produce three kinds of sound. Normal, good sound if the device and all its component parts are in spec. Varying degrees of knocking, ticking, or rattling if there's any wear or looseness between components that mate or move in close proximity to each other. And scraping, squealing, or thumping if the parts are too tight, either because of tight tolerances or friction that's caused them to expand. If your search takes you to the engine, the noise you're pinning down will most likely be found in one of these areas. The cylinder head, the accessory drive components, including the belts, the front cover, the oil or water pump, or the cylinder block. We'll now take a closer look at each of these areas and point out how the noise that's produced is related to engine temperature and load. We'll also share some clues which will help you identify the source. An important clue you can use to identify the probable source of an engine noise is the temperature at which it's clearest. Noises that are associated with a cold engine condition include tappet noise and piston slap. Noises that are more likely to occur when the engine's warm include piston pin knock, main bearing thump, connecting rod knock, rocker arm or fulcrum tick, camshaft chucking, timing belt or chain whine, and timing gear whine. Noises that'll appear at any engine temperature include the time tick noise of an exhaust leak, the continuous hiss of a vacuum leak, the whine of the power steering pump and alternator, and the tick of an accessory belt that's chunked or has debris lodged in its grooves. Noises that appear to come from the cylinder head are usually higher in frequency than the noises that are typically heard near the engine block or oil pan. Cylinder head noise is usually related to valve train components, the tappets, push rods if the engine's equipped with them, rocker arms, valve springs, valve guides, the valves themselves, and the camshaft. Cold tappet noise, a tapping sound with a frequency one half of crankshaft speed, is most likely to be heard at startup with the engine in a no load condition. This noise tends to go away as the engine warms up and oil distribution improves. A collapsed tappet will produce a similar noise also at one half crankshaft speed that's noticeable under all operating conditions. Rocker arm noise may take either one of two forms, a squeak or a tick. 
The fine bird-like squeak or tweet is caused by the fulcrum rubbing against the rocker arm. The ticking sound occurs when wear in the area of the fulcrum results in too much clearance between the rocker arm pads and the tappets or push rods and the valve stems. Both sounds are best heard when the engine's warm and at idle, either in gear or in neutral. These sounds will appear to come from under the rocker covers and will tend to go away as engine speed increases. When the camshaft produces a noise, the noise is generally due to a back and forth chucking action caused by excessive end play. The noise produced is a light thumping or knocking that's most evident when the engine's warm and idling, in gear or in neutral. The sound may also tend to be irregular and vary in frequency. The noise created by a broken valve spring or by one with incorrect load is much like the sound associated with a collapsed tappet, a tapping noise created by the rocker arm contacting the valve stem. Valve spring noise occurs when the spring loses its tension or breaks due to metal fatigue. Either condition creates too great a clearance between the rocker arm and valve stem. Valve guide wear typically results from infrequent oil changes and is most apparent at the top and bottom of the guide. The noise created by valve guide wear is similar to the noise that's produced by a collapsed tappet or broken valve spring, a ticking sound. A clue that the valve guides are worn may be blue smoke from the exhaust, signaling that oil is bypassing the valve stem and is being burned in the combustion chamber. Because it's difficult to tell the difference between valve train noises, be sure to check all the valve trained components when you've isolated the noise under the rocker or cam cover. Also be sure to check for valve stem wear if the guides prove to be worn. The two go hand in hand. The necessary valve train analysis guidelines can be found in the vehicle service manual. Perhaps the most familiar of all engine-related noises are those produced by the front-end accessory drive system, the belts and the components they actuate. The two most common belt noises, belt squeal and belt chirp, are relatively easy to detect. Belt squeal is most noticeable on startup and acceleration or when the engine's revved. Belt chirp is present almost all the time. Belt noise is seldom caused by belt wear or damage. Instead, it's usually related to belt tension or to pulley misalignment. If you suspect the belt's the source of the noise, you can make sure by spraying a stream of clean water on it. If the noise disappears, the belt's the source. Never apply a belt dressing or silicone spray to a belt, either to diagnose a noise or as a repair. Belt dressings and silicone sprays may provide a temporary fix for a few minutes or a few miles, but the noise will return. These substances are also known to damage and shorten belt life, so stick with clean water for diagnosis. When checking a belt, also determine if it's properly tensioned using a belt tension gauge. If the tension's out of spec, correct it. A belt that's over-tensioned may cause the accessory bearings to wear and may lead to noise from the crankshaft front main bearing. On a system that has an automatic tensioner, a low tension reading may indicate that the tensioner's defective. If a serpentine accessory belt shows minor cracking, which may appear around 25,000 miles, the belt's most likely okay. If chunks of material have separated from the belt, or if it's frayed, it may need to be replaced. Refer to your service manual to determine if it should. If belt chirp seems to be a concern, Leave the belt on and check the alignment of the pulleys visually and with a straight edge. And check the witness marks on the pulleys. The witness marks are the marks left on the pulleys by the belt. If the pulleys are out of alignment or suffer excess runout where one edge is tilted and produces a wobbling motion, follow the instructions in the service manual to correct the condition. 
High-pitched alternator and power steering whine may appear with the engine cold, warm, or hot. Alternator whine tends to be more apparent at idle or above, while power steering whine is more pronounced at idle only. Alternator whine is easily confirmed because turning the steering wheel has no effect on the noise. Power steering whine, on the other hand, originates in the power steering pump and usually increases when the wheel's turned. Another source of a whine-like sound may be the timing belt or timing chain. Either sound will appear with the engine warm, at idle or above, and seem to come from under the engine front cover. You'll notice that the frequency of timing belt or chain noises seems to change in relation to changes in engine speed. While the whine from a timing belt or chain is usually due to too much tension, a different noise is produced by too little tension. A loose timing belt, for example, will produce what might be called a grating or warbling sound, possibly interspersed with clicks or slaps. Timing gear whine also tends to appear when the engine's warm and at idle or under a light load, but it tends to disappear as engine speed increases. The water and oil pumps produce their own unique sounds. Water pump bearings, for example, will pit or wear due to poor cooling system maintenance. The noise that's produced will sound like a clicking or rapping, and it'll be duller and more solid than valve train noise. Worn water pump bearings may cause the impeller shaft to wobble, which in turn may cause the impeller to rub against the pump housing, producing a deeper rattling sound. An oil pump with worn gears will produce a heavy metallic noise that sounds like a rattle at idle and more like a vibration at 2,000 RPM. Noises which are most likely to come from the cylinder block area include piston slap, piston pin knock, main bearing knock, and connecting rod knock. Piston slap is most noticeable when the engine's cold at part throttle under light acceleration. The sound produced is a light knocking that goes away as the engine warms up due to the thermal expansion of the piston. The cause of the condition is excessive clearance between the piston and cylinder wall. While a stethoscope will help point you to the right cylinder, a method that may help you hear better is to pull the spark plug wires one at a time until the noise goes away. You could also try disconnecting the electrical connector to the fuel injector. When the noise goes away, you've located the cylinder that's experiencing the piston slap. Piston pin knock is most commonly heard with the engine warm at idle or in drive. The characteristic sound is a sharp rap or double knock that seems to increase under load. Like most noises that come from the cylinder block, piston pin knock, although a rare event, usually results from a history of poor lubrication that's created excessive clearance. In this case, the clearance is between the piston pin and piston. Connecting rod knock is caused by too much clearance between the rod bearing and crankshaft. The sound produced is typically a light metallic knock that's most audible on deceleration. Connecting rod knock tends to decrease when the vehicle is coasting or shifted to neutral. Main bearing thump or knock is most obvious when the engine's warm, between 1,000 and 1,500 RPM and under heavy load. The noise will typically sound like a dull, deep thud and will usually be less constant than a rod knock. The sound will appear to come from the area of the crankshaft pulley or oil pan and will appear to go away as engine speed increases. If the vehicle's equipped with an automatic transmission, a drive engine run-up test is the best way to find main bearing thump. Slowly increase the engine speed from idle to about 1,600 RPM and listen carefully. 
The noise may be difficult to hear due to other background noise. In the case of the front mains, the noise can often be reduced or eliminated by temporarily removing the accessory drive belt or by eliminating the combustion in the number one cylinder. The most common cause of main bearing noise is a history of poor lubrication or excessive clearance to the main bearing. An accessory belt that's too tight may also be instrumental in producing the noise from the front main bearing. Although front main bearing knock can be annoying, it seldom indicates a failure. In the first half of this program, you've seen that a thorough diagnosis is the key to isolating the source of an engine noise concern. We demonstrated that you have to get the big picture first, then methodically work your way down to the root cause. If you practice the systematic method we've shown, you'll be a lot more likely to make the right diagnosis and the right repair the first time. The key skill you need when you're working on an engine noise concern is a well-trained critical ear. The engine sounds we've provided will help, but you may have to listen to some known good engines so you have something to compare against. Train yourself. In the next half of the program, we'll take an in-depth look at modern engine sealing techniques and oil leak detection. Stick around. Engine sealing technology has undergone dramatic improvement in a short span of time. Many of the functions which were performed by paper and cork composite gaskets are now being handled by silicone rubber gaskets. Pre-applied and liquid thread lockers and sealants used on threaded fasteners are easy to apply. They flow to cover the entire sealing surface. They coat and fill surface irregularities and they permit metal-to-metal -metal contact of the surfaces being sealed. The new generation of silicone rubber gaskets come in a variety of forms. Floppy, with molded-in limiters to control gasket crush. Press-in groove, similar to O-ring type sealing. And carrier, with the silicone rubber molded onto the plastic. The distinct advantages of silicone rubber gaskets include very high temperature capabilities, a must in today's underhood environment, ease of assembly, controlled crush of the gasket in the joint with the use of molded in metal limiters, reusability, and outstanding resistance to all types of fluids. Despite all these advantages, however, today's generation of gaskets and sealants are no better than no gasket at all. If they're used the wrong way, or if the leak is diagnosed incorrectly. To help you avoid these mistakes, this section of our program provides information on the characteristics, selection, and use of liquid sealants and gasketing materials. Perhaps more important, it also covers the diagnostic process that should be followed to locate engine oil leaks. We'll be demonstrating two methods of oil leak detection. The first using an ultraviolet light and fluorescent dye. The second method using a controlled supply of shop air to pressurize the crankcase so leaks can be located when a soap solution is applied to potential leakage points. Done properly, either method is an effective way to locate leaks. As we proceed, we'll also share a number of diagnosis and repair tips which are known to be effective in eliminating repeat repairs. An engine is a dynamic system that places many punishing stresses on sealants and fasteners. Among the more extreme of the forces that can cause premature failure are temperature changes that cause components to expand and contract, vibration and shock, and the pressures produced inside the engine. Some of the other reasons that seals and fasteners fail are more preventable, especially in the service bay. These include incorrect fastener torque, improper assembly or reassembly, damaged threads, the use of incorrect materials, particularly sealants, or failure to clean mating surfaces and threads thoroughly and correctly. 
Most of these conditions can be prevented by following the repair procedures provided in the vehicle service manual. Right now, let's take a closer look at threaded fasteners, liquid thread lockers, gaskets, and formed in place gaskets. The most common device used to join components is the threaded fastener. Although bolts and nuts come in many strengths and sizes, their chief job is to clamp objects together. This ability of a fastener to clamp objects and prevent them from moving is called clamping force. The amount of clamping force provided by a fastener is determined by the tension in it. Tension is produced by applying torque to the fastener. As torque is applied and tension increases, the bolt actually stretches, much like a spring. When a new bolt is installed in the factory, a specified torque is applied to stretch the bolt and deliver the required clamp load. If the bolt load limit is exceeded, the bolt may break or become permanently deformed. The clamp load limit may also be the peak load a joint can withstand without being damaged. Castings may break. Bearings or bores may distort, or gaskets may be crushed when excessive torque is applied. When the right amount of torque is applied and the required clamping force is achieved, friction between the male and female threads of the fastener and between the bolt head and the bearing surface it's contacting will hold the fastener in position and prevent it from working loose. When a fastener fails, a leak may occur past its threads or at the gasket located between the components being clamped together. This is a common occurrence that has several predictable causes. The fastener may have been incorrectly tensioned when it was installed. This situation is easily avoided by using a torque wrench during installation to achieve the proper clamp load. So much tension may have been applied to the fastener that it was permanently deformed or threads were stripped. Or the components being held together by the fastener have moved in relationship to each other. This is the most common reason for a loss of clamp load, and such movement may occur for a variety of reasons. Shock or impact may overcome the friction between the components. Or thermal expansion may cause the two clamped materials to expand and contract at different rates. Combine these sideways movements with the clearance required between the threads of the fastener and the hole it passes through, and a rocking effect occurs that causes the fastener to unwind. A final reason that fasteners lose their holding power is a lack of structural rigidity and a relaxation of gaskets between mating surfaces. The force a fastener places on a gasket may cause the gasket to collapse. When you're making a repair and are getting ready to reassemble the engine or subassembly, an important part of your preparation must be to turn to the vehicle service manual to determine whether to reuse the fasteners you removed earlier or replace them. The manual also shows the torques which must be applied, the proper tightening sequence, and the right methods for preparing the bolts for reassembly. Some require a cleaning and oiling, Others require the application of a liquid thread locker or thread sealant. When a bolt's originally installed, some damage is bound to be done to the threads. Removing the bolt compounds the condition and further decreases the clamp load capacity. If the bolt had been treated with a pre-applied thread locker, you might not be able to tell. The application of a liquid thread locker will enable it to hold as well as it did when it was originally installed. To make sure a reused bolt will achieve the right clamp load, do as the service manual recommends. Clean the bolt and bolt holes with brake cleaner or an equivalent substance. Allow them to air dry. Apply the recommended sealant or thread locker if it's called for. Then torque the fastener to specification. Which thread locker should you use? Do as the service manual recommends or remember this rule of thumb, red, white, and blue. 
Red Threadlock 262 is an anaerobic sealant and thread locker that cures to an extremely tough plastic. Because it's an anaerobic product, it cures in the absence of air. You don't have to worry that it'll harden or set up between the time it's applied and installed. Threadlock 262 is formulated for use on fasteners that secure steel and cast iron parts, particularly internal engine components. Once Threadlock 262 is fully cured, which takes about 24 hours after assembly, heavy duty tools or high heat are needed to break the bond. Never use Threadlock 262 on soft metals like aluminum or magnesium. The bond is so strong that the threads are likely to be stripped when removal is attempted. White pipe sealant with Teflon is a slow curing compound that works as a lubricant and sealer only. It provides no strength to the joint. The Teflon in the mixture provides lubrication during installation. White pipe sealant is typically used on piping and connections that must contain air, oil, or coolant. Use it on pipe threads, sensors, and threaded plugs. Parts treated with white pipe sealant can be removed easily with hand tools after the sealant is cured. And because it's slow to cure, the fitting or device to which it's applied can be repositioned for proper alignment for as long as four hours after installation. Blue thread lock and sealer is a fast curing anaerobic medium strength product that is typically used on fasteners that are visible. For example, the fasteners that secure valve covers, oil pans, front covers, and light duty brackets. Blue thread lock and sealer is service tool removable and is the right choice for securing fasteners to aluminum or other lightweight metals. When you apply these thread lockers and sealants, be sure to use the right amount. All that's needed is enough to fill the threads with just a little left over. Use just one or two drops of either Threadlock 262 or Threadlock and Sealer. When you install the fasteners to which these anaerobics are applied, torque them as quickly as possible. When applying white pipe sealant with Teflon, run an even bead around the second and third threads. Then install and position the device or fitting. And remember, not all bolts require a thread locker or sealant. Be sure to follow the service manual recommendations. Sealing flanges, like those where the oil pan and block meet, or between machine surfaces, presents a special sealing challenge. Flanges may bow or flex due to unequal distribution of clamp load around the edge of the sealing surfaces. Leaks are most likely to occur where the clamp load of the fasteners is the weakest, midway between adjacent bolts. Distortion also occurs around bolt holes. The high stress placed on a bolt can be transferred to the material under the bolt head, causing a gasket to crack, tear, rupture, or extrude. Deterioration of the gasket leads to a loss of clamping force, and that leads to a leak. Distortion may exist when the surfaces to be joined aren't parallel. A cocked flange may be caused by improper machining, improper heat treating, casting irregularities, an incorrect bolt tightening sequence, or damage in service. A final sealing challenge is the relative roughness of the surface. The rougher the surface finish, the greater the chance for a leak to occur. Even the smoothest mirror finishes look rough when viewed with high enough magnification. Fluid will attempt to flow through the valleys between the high spots in the surface. The two formed in place gasket materials you're most likely to work with are anaerobic compounds like Ford Gasket Maker and RTV, like Ford Silicone Gasket and Sealant. The anaerobic gasket maker is highly resistant to fluid transfer and cures to a tough plastic. In addition to their adhesive qualities, anaerobic gasket makers actually make assemblies stronger because they permit metal to metal flange contact. The anaerobic material fills surface irregularities and machining imperfections, however small, enabling the high spots of the metal surfaces to contact one another. 
The metal-to-metal -metal contact increases the friction between components and restricts their movement. RTV silicone sealant cures to a solid silicone rubber when it's exposed to the humidity in the air. When applying RTV or an anaerobic sealant, the key word is cleanliness. If the surface to which the sealant is to be applied is contaminated with oil, grease, coolant, or old gasket material, a good leak-proof seal will be all but impossible to achieve. The quality of the seal is directly related to the cleanliness of the surface. The preferred method for cleaning the flange is to carefully scrape away any trace of gasket material. Then use brake cleaner to remove all traces of oil and other foreign material. Never use carburetor cleaner or other petroleum-based products to clean flanges. It's also a good idea to avoid using soap and water as cleaning agents. Any soap film that's left behind may act just like the hydrocarbon residue that's left by carb cleaner and interfere with the bond between the RTV and metal surfaces. The next step in the sealing process is to use the right sealant. Avoid substituting sealant products from your local parts store for those specified in the Ford service manual. There's no way of knowing if the parts store's products meet Ford's quality and durability standards. It's also critical that you apply the sealant in the right quantity and manner. Be sure to fill channels completely. And refer to the service manual for the proper size bead to apply on other surfaces. When applying the sealant, squeeze it out ahead of the cartridge to obtain a consistent bead size and eliminate air pockets. When the bead's laid down, reassemble the component while the RTV is still wet and before a skin starts to form. You only have four or five minutes tops. When RTV is allowed to set up or skin over, it won't seal properly, increasing the chance that a new leak will appear later. Anaerobics don't begin to cure until the joints assemble, so it's less important to assemble the mating component quickly. RTV is such an effective sealant that some technicians have been tempted to use it even when it's not called for. To prevent repeat repairs, pay attention to what the service manual tells you and follow this advice. Never apply RTV on a silicone gasket unless it's specifically called for by the service manual. If the manual says to use a gasket, no RTV, use only a gasket. Using RTV when a gasket's called for may cause shimming. By the way, when you're installing a gasket, avoid the use of assembly aids like tackums. They also leave a residue which may interfere with sealing. The vehicle service manual indicates which gasket positioning aids are acceptable. As you saw in our discussion of noise diagnosis, the most important thing you can do when you're diagnosing a customer concern is be systematic. A systematic leak diagnosis helps eliminate the temptation to think that the leak's located where the fluid's dripping. Although the leak and the drip may be in the same place, it's more likely the leak is somewhere else. The reason's simple enough. Gravity pulls the leaking fluid down and air moving around the engine may force the fluid toward the back of the engine compartment. An important outcome of the diagnostic interview is historical information that provides you with more clues. For example, is this the first time the vehicle's been serviced for a leak? Could an earlier repair be the cause? Or was the last repair misdiagnosed? And what fluid seems to be leaking and in what amount? After that, perform a thorough visual inspection under the hood. Although you may not detect the leak when performing this step, you may identify other conditions that need your attention. You may be able to save your customer a repeat visit for another concern. In addition to looking for evidence of the leak, keep an eye open for any obvious irregularities with the vacuum hoses, wiring, and belts. 
Check the hoses and clamps, too, for deterioration and obvious leaks. Check all the fluids. Pull the dipstick and check the oil. Is it low? Do you know if oil's been added lately? How much or how often? Is the condition of the oil okay? Or is there evidence that oil and filter changes have been few and far between? Look at the coolant, too. Is the level okay? The condition? How long's it been since the cooling system was last flushed and recharged? Odds are never. How's the transmission fluid? Level okay? Color and smell okay? Quality okay? Did any of the fluids show evidence of contamination by other fluids? Sure signs of internal engine leaks. After you've identified the leaking fluid as engine oil and visually inspected the engine, visually inspect the areas that in the past have been most likely to show an oil leak. The oil fill cap gasket, the rocker or cam cover gaskets, the intake manifold gaskets, the cylinder head gasket, the front cover gasket, the distributor O-ring if the vehicle's equipped with a distributor, the dipstick tube connection at the block, the oil pressure sending unit, and all cup or pipe plugs. If you're unable to detect a leak in one of these areas, raise the vehicle in the air and visually check the oil pan gasket, the oil pan drain plug, all seals and engine plugs, and of course, the oil filter. Oh, by the way, if you see discoloration like this around the weep hole on the water pump, leave it alone. Some pumps normally have a minute discharge. Monitor the coolant level. If you're still unable to eyeball the leak, stop what you're doing and check the engine using either the black light and fluorescent dye method or the air pressurization method. It makes no sense at this time to get involved in a major teardown, even if you strongly suspect the leaks at the rear of the engine. And by all means, resist the temptation to go after the front and rear crankshaft seals until you're 100% sure there's no other alternative. The small amount of time needed to confirm the location of the leak by checking with a dye or a soap solution is time well spent. The first thing you should do when checking for an oil leak using an ultraviolet lamp and fluorescent dye is turn on the lamp and let it warm up. It may take as long as 10 minutes to produce the maximum ultraviolet light. Drain the old engine oil completely and change the filter. Then, using a suitable solvent like engine degreaser, clean all traces of oil from the surfaces and joints where leaks are likely to occur. The cylinder block, heads, rocker covers, oil pan, and the flywheel housing area. Then, premix with the recommended engine oil not less than a half fluid ounce and not more than one fluid ounce of fluorescent oil additive. Pour this mixture into the oil fill. Then start the engine and let it idle for at least 15 minutes. After 15 minutes have elapsed, stop the engine and promptly inspect all seal and gasket areas, starting at the top of the engine and working down. Note that the black light is unaffected by ambient lighting. So if a leak shows up when this method's used, it'll appear as a bright green, yellow, or orange area. If you suspect the leaks in an area you can't hit directly with the light, Try using a flex mirror to reflect the ultraviolet light into the area. If that way won't work, wipe the hard to get at area with a clean shop rag and then focus the light on the rag. If the leak doesn't show up after 15 minutes of engine operation, it may be necessary to run the engine longer. Several hours may be needed. It may be best to have the customer take the vehicle home overnight, then bring it back first thing in the morning. Sure, it's an inconvenience, but at least you'll be sure the engines achieve the temperatures and pressures which could cause the leak to show up. As another alternative, you could apply a controlled one to three pounds per square inch, no more than three, of shop air to the engine as you start the dye test. The presence of the air pressure may be enough to accelerate the leak. Testing the engine for leaks by applying air pressure is demonstrated in the next section of this program. If you detect a leak when using the black light and dye, make a note of the repair that's needed, 
Then inspect the rest of the engine from above and below. There's no better time than now to make sure you've located the only leak. If you think the drain plug's leaking, clean the area around it so a leak will be visible, and then check it. If you're checking an engine that's equipped with preformed gaskets and detect a leak along a seam, carefully remove the cover and check for the presence of oil outside the gasketed area. Leaks can be channeled through the groove to different locations, so backtrack the leak to its source. If you're unable to detect a leak using the black light and dye method, pressurize the engine with a constant supply of shop air and apply a soap solution to potential leakage points. Pressurizing the engine must be done with extreme care, however, because when too much pressure is applied, you may blow out the seals and create new leaks where none existed before. Also remember that this test is better performed on a cold engine than on a warm one. If you've been running the engine, let it cool down before starting the test, or have the customer drop the car off the night before. Give parts that have expanded a chance to return to their cold dimension so any leak will be more likely to appear. Before you start, fabricate a device that's capable of applying a constant one to three pounds of air pressure to the engine. If you see five PSI printed in the service manual, you'd better cross it out and write in one to three. Fabricating the device isn't all that hard to do if you follow the instructions in the accompanying booklet. And besides, once you've made it up, it's sure to come in handy in the future. When this device is installed, it's easy to deliver a constant supply of air that leaves your hands and eyes free to work around the engine. Before starting the test, make sure the regulator valves completely close so you don't accidentally apply a big burst of air to the engine when you start the test. Because you want to trap air in the engine, make sure to plug any ports and passages that will allow air to escape, such as the PCV valve or air inlet connection. After that, slowly open the regulator valve until between 1 and 3 psi of air registers on the gauge. Then, keeping the pressure applied, brush or squirt a solution of liquid detergent and water or snoop pressure check over the seal and gasket areas. Bubbles will form around a leaking area. It's normal to see bubbles that look like light foam around the rocker arm cover bolts and crankshaft seals. This doesn't signal a problem, unless oil's also present. If leakage occurs around the rocker cover's isolator grommets, the cover should be removed and the grommets checked. If the grommets have deteriorated, they'll have a mushy feel to them and should be replaced. With the problem isolated, check the rest of the engine. Then make the needed repair and apply the prescribed torque and tightening sequence to prevent non-uniform loading. When the repair is finished, especially if it was at the bottom of the engine and a sealant was used as part of the repair, wait at least one half hour before adding new oil and running the engine. Give the sealant time to set up properly. Well, that about wraps it up. The information we've provided and the techniques you've seen demonstrated in this program should be of help whenever you're faced with a noise or a leak diagnosis challenge. The repair tips included along the way will help ensure that your repairs stay repaired and your customer is satisfied. Service to the customer, that's what it's all about. For a quick memory jogger when you're working on a noise or leak concern, be sure to refer to the booklet and the job aid cards we've included with your tape. Put the cards right in your toolbox. That way they'll be handy when you need them. Hey, thanks for watching.